The scripture reading this morning comes from Matthew 11, verses 28 through 30. This will be from the King James Version. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. You may be seated. The passage that we have just read together is often called the Lord's Invitation. Jesus says, come, come to me. That means leave where you are, come to where, where I am, but that means that we must accept what he says, accept what he's offering, accept the life that he expects us to live. Come to me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. The sins and the cares of this world can burden us down. They can weigh more than spiritually we can carry. They do. We need help. And Jesus offers us this invitation to come to Him for rest. He offers us rest, relief from that burden. He offers us rest from our labors. He saves us and not we ourselves. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I shall give you rest. Take my yoke, though. He says there's something you're going to have to do. There is a burden you're going to have to bear. There is work for you in my service. Take my yoke and learn of me. We're going to have to accept the fact that we're going to try to live our lives like he lived his. Learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. Our Savior, the Son of God, the glorious King of all the universe, when he lived as a man, was meek and lowly. He says, learn of me. You're going to have to be like me if you're going to follow me. You're going to come to me for this rest. You'll have to be meek and lowly as well. But he says, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. We can do it. We can come to him. We can receive the rest that he offers. We can live acceptably and according to his expectations. It is possible. His yoke is easy. His burden is light. The Christian life is the best life that this world has to offer. Blessings, spiritual blessings are found only in Christ Jesus. Ephesians 1 verse 3. But the question that we ask is how do we come? How do we respond to this invitation? How do we come to Jesus for the rest that He offers? What is expected of us? How do I respond to the invitation? There are what we sometimes call two laws of pardon. The first law of pardon, the second law of pardon. They're not called that in the Bible. We call them that based on the situation that a person is in. Based on how... This invitation then applies to them. The first law of pardon is for a person who is seeking initial forgiveness of their sins. The first time that they hear the gospel and understand it and are ready to respond to it. That means that obedience to Jesus' commands is necessary. Jesus commands us to believe in Him as the Son of God, to repent of our sins, to change, to turn our course of life in a different direction to confess His sweet name, to confess that He is now the Lord of our lives and we have come to Him to learn of Him. And then He commands us to be baptized in His name, in water, for the remission of sins. That's how we contact His blood. That's the first law of pardon and it is at that moment that our sins are initially, for the first time, washed away, taken off of our record. And we are looked at then as innocent by God because of what Jesus has done for us. That's the first law of pardon. The second is when we've done those things. We have been obedient. We understood. We know what God expects of us, but still we have committed sin. We may have gone back completely to a former way of life. We may have re-repented. We may have turned our course back in its original direction. In that case, as we see an example of in Acts chapter 8 with Simon the sorcerer, What is required of us is not to be baptized again. Baptism is something that we obey once when we understand it. We know what's going on and our sins are washed away. But it is possible after that to go back to sin, to take up that burden again, to take up that spiritual weight which so easily besets us. It is possible to do that. And in that case, we have an example 
what we must do then is repent, come back to God, come back to Jesus, have Him take that burden off of us once again, repent, confess our sins, and ask for prayers. That's the second law of pardon. Jesus wants us to come to Him. He wants us to respond to the invitation. When we preach a sermon, and every time that I preach you will hear it, when we preach a sermon and at the end of it we extend the invitation, we explain what a person must do in order to be obedient to the gospel, or we offer the invitation to come forward, this is what we're asking you to do to respond to the Lord's invitation. In the one year now, one year and one month that we've been here, there may have been a handful, six or seven maybe if I remember correctly, public responses to the Lord's invitation. And that's great, that's good, that's fantastic. We rejoice with those who have made that kind of response. The congregation with which we worked in Florida was a different congregation in a different city, in a different spiritual climate in the community. It was a different set of people with a different set of needs. And there we had almost, it averaged out, to about one public response per per uh, assembly. In a year, there would be about a hundred public responses asking for prayers. And that's in addition to We averaged about a dozen baptisms a year. That's not to lift one congregation up above another or to put one down. That is to say that different congregations have different needs and different expectations. We rejoice when a person responds to the invitation. But not all responses are public. In fact, the Scripture does not command us to make a public response. I believe that every person every time you hear the message of the gospel preached, every time you sit through a sermon, every person has a response to this message. It's impossible to hear it and not be affected. That's the nature of God's word. Every person makes a response. It's not always necessary to publicly respond. Even when you know that you have sin in your life, that you need to repent, you need to confess, and you need forgiveness of. It's not necessary to make public response. There are examples of public responses in Scripture. In fact, every conversion really is a public response. On the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, 3,000 responded publicly. And later on there were 5,000. But as you go through the book of Acts, you see the number of public responses diminish until near the end of the book it was very rare even to even find a single person responding publicly to the Lord's invitation. But I do believe it is an absolute necessity. It is a biblical example that we extend the Lord's invitation every time we come together for worship. Public response is not necessary. That's between you and God. You can find a brother or sister in Christ that you can confess to, that you can talk with, that you can ask for prayers from. And we can make that known publicly if you would so desire, but public response is not absolutely necessary. We do so at the end of every sermon, really a lot of times out of convenience. Many times the the message will prick you, will cut you so deeply to your heart that you recognize, I cannot go another moment in the condition that I'm in. And so we give you the opportunity to publicly respond. But again, as long as you make your life right, that's what we're offering. That's what we're asking you to do. That's what the invitation is. This morning, I want us to go back before that invitation is ever offered at the end of every sermon. And I want us to go through the process that we use to hear the message, what we might go through individually before we get ready to ask that question, do I need to publicly respond today? I, I, it's my desire to help in creating an atmosphere here at 6th Avenue that is welcoming, that is warm, that will engage you to publicly respond. I want us to have a, a family feeling here that we feel comfortable opening up to each other, making confession and asking God's forgiveness. But that's going to take us going back before the invitation is offered and considering our own response to the message 
as a whole. It's going to take us going back and listening to the message and seeing how it applies to us. So let's walk through that process before we ever come to the extension of the invitation and think about your situation now at the beginning of this lesson in contrast to where you'll be at the end of it. First of all, what you must do when we're considering whether to respond to the invitation, the Lord's invitation, is we must listen to the message. It is absolutely necessary that we hear. When we break down and we have collected all that the New Testament says and we have come up with five steps of salvation. And really it's not so simple. But these are things that the Lord says. We must hear the Word of God. It is only through the hearing of the Gospel that faith is created. Romans 10 verse 17. Faith has no other source. We do not come to believe in God, believe in Jesus Christ and his, as His Son, and know what to do in order to be pleasing with Him without it being revealed in God's Word. Romans 10 17 says, So then faith cometh by hearing. There is no other source of faith and hearing by the Word of God. Luke 8 verse 18, Jesus says, Take heed how ye hear. It is important that we listen and we listen correctly. I want you to understand that no sermon, no preaching from God's Word is ever meant to hurt or humiliate you. That is not the purpose of our preaching. But we are trying to help you. If sin is still on your account, it is our desire that God be able, be allowed, that you will permit Him to wipe your slate clean. That's what our preaching is about. Now that may take some change. It may take some pain of separation from a former way of life. But our intention is not to hurt or to humiliate you. It never is. It never will be. Here in Luke 8 verse 18, Jesus continues there. He says, take, the, take heed or take care then how ye hear. For to the one who has, more will be given. And from the one who has not, even what he thinks he has will be taken away. Jesus isn't talking about money or physical possessions. He's not talking about material goods in this passage. What he's talking about to these people here is their position, their security, a way of life that they thought was right with God. He says even those who think they have it right with God when they understand, when they hear the message, when they see who I truly am, what they think they have is even going to be taken away from them. But it all comes back to how we hear the message. Take heed how you hear it. Paul would say, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. There is the possibility that every gospel sermon should cause us to make a drastic change in our lives. We must listen, and we must listen attentively. We're not trying to humiliate or harm you. We're not trying to spoil your fun in this life. You may think, well, he's asking me to give up drinking and give up smoking and give up gambling and give up sleeping around. Yes, we're asking you to do that, but not because we're trying to take away your fun in life. We're trying to give you a better future. We're trying to give you a hope of eternal life in heaven with God. It is for your good. We're speaking a message of love. God is love. Jesus loved the whole world that He gave His, He gave His life for us. Love, agape, biblical love means we want what is best for you. So please, before you consider responding to the invitation, listen to the message and admit, accept that it may apply to you. Every command of God, whether prohibitive, whether it prohibits us from doing something, or permissive, it gives us authorization for doing something good for someone else. Every command of God is for our good. Moses said that to the Israelites, Deuteronomy 6, verse 24, that he, he gave us these commands to follow for our good always. Every command of God is for our good. And that is both physically and spiritually. 
living, responding to the Lord's invitation, coming to Jesus for this rest, is not only good for us spiritually, giving us relief from that burden, but it is good for us physically. It's a better way of life. It reduces our stress. It reduces some of the toxins maybe that we put into our bodies. It's good for us in every possible way. We're only seeking your best. We're not required in the New Testament as Christians to make to take vows of poverty or abstinence. That's not required of God. That is taking those things to an extreme and a person has the right and the liberty to take that vow personally, but it's not something that is placed upon us as a restriction, as a way of forbidding us from uh, engaging in certain practices, but all of the commands of God are for our good. So please, before you respond to the invitation, listen to the message. Take heed how you hear. Listen to the message then with an open heart. With an open heart. The heart I'm referring to here is the seat of your emotion. It is the source of your emotions. And, and often in the scriptures, heart and mind are, are the same idea, the same concept. And, and in a sense, they are. But I'm trying to make a distinction here, and I'll show you why in just a moment. But I'm, I'm making a distinction between your heart and your mind. On the two really most famous accounts, most familiar accounts to us of the condition of the heart of those who have listened to the message we find two very different responses. In Acts chapter 2, the day of Pentecost, Jesus has been resurrected. He has ascended back to heaven. And now for the first time, the apostles are preaching salvation in the name of Jesus Christ by repentance and baptism for the first time. And He's preaching, they are preaching here on this occasion to the very same people who cried out, Crucify Him. Crucify Him. His blood be upon us and our children. And He convinces them that they are guilty of His murder. That they are guilty of crucifying their Savior, their Messiah, the long-expected One, their, their Deliverer. They've killed Him. And Acts 2 verse 37 says they were pricked in their hearts. And this is a large crowd. And they all respond. Many of them publicly, 3,000 on this occasion, are baptized into Jesus Christ, are added to the church. Those phrases are found here in Acts chapter 2. They respond publicly because they listened to the message with an open heart. When they heard the truth, they responded publicly. They could not wait. They would not wait. It was immediate but they were cut to their heart. But then in Acts chapter 7, Stephen is a man full of power and of the Holy Ghost, and he is speaking to this council of Jews, and he takes them through the history of Israel, and he says to them, you are stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, verse 51. He says, you always resist the Holy Ghost. As your fathers did, so do ye. He preached a message that they were not willing to hear. He preached the same Jesus Christ. He proved to them from their own scriptures that they knew and believed that He was their Messiah, their Deliverer. But they rejected responding to that invitation. And in verse 54, when they heard these things... They were cut to the heart. It's basically the same concept. They were cut to the heart and they gnashed on Him with their teeth. Verse 58 says, they laid their... uh, Verse 57, they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon Him with one accord and they stoned Stephen. It was the same message. It was the same invitation. But the response was totally different because of the condition of their hearts. On the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, 3,000 of them responded and said, we accept our guilt and we know that only Jesus Christ can take it away. But here in Acts chapter 7, the council said, we don't care what you say, I'm going to keep living the way I want to live. 
and we're going to kill you for telling us that we're wrong. You must listen to the message with an open heart. Every person will respond every time he hears the gospel, but it starts in your heart. Your heart then will lead you to open your mind. An open heart will lead to an open mind. And an open mind will lead to direction of your body to submit to the commands of God. It begins with the heart, it moves to the mind, and then to the body. That's what I'm trying to get to. That's why I'm drawing a distinction between heart and mind here. Faith, belief, acceptance of the facts, the truth, occurs in the heart. And that then tells our mind, leads our mind to make a change to turn, to seek and pursue a new direction, a new course, a new way of life. Repentance happens in the mind after faith has sprung up in our hearts. Our heart, faith is an emotional response. In our minds, repentance is an intellectual response. And that then leads us to accept and to obey the command with our body our physical obedience to the command to be baptized. But it begins in the heart. The heart leads to a change of mind, which leads to a change of our actions in our flesh, in our physical bodies. But we must then listen to that message. We must hear the invitation with an open heart. Allow it to sink down into your seat of emotion and say, He did this for me. He loved me so much that although He was guilty of no sin, He went to the cross, He shed His blood, He died, but He was resurrected for me. Open your heart to those facts. Let it change you emotionally so that you will change intellectually, so you will change your mind, your course, so that you will repent. And let that lead to a change of action from this point forward. Listen to the message and listen with an open heart. And as you're doing so, make self-assessment. What I mean by this is ask yourself, what needs to change in my life? I hear what Jesus has done for me. I believe that He is real. I believe everything that has been confirmed about Him. I believe what the Bible says I must now do. What then is going to be different for me from this point forward? What needs to change in my life. It may be the way we speak. It may be the way we dress. It may be the way we treat others. There are going to be a lot of changes in our lives. I want us to look at two separate examples that give us uh, opposite reactions. Again, a contrast of the opportunities that lie before us as we're making this self-assessment in Acts chapter 8. Philip has come to Samaria and the gospel has been preached to the Samaritans. And again, as we mentioned earlier, Simon the sorcerer, Simon the Magi is one who who responds. He has been obedient to the gospel, but his heart is it quickly goes back to the former way of life. He was a deceiver. He was one who took advantage of the people in Samaria and he got wealthy through his deception. And he sees, verse 18, a power that the apostles have. The apostles have the ability and the power to pass on spiritual gifts, miraculous gifts to others. And Simon says, I want the power that the apostles have. He offers them money. And Peter says this in verse 20, Thy money perish with thee because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter, for thy heart is not right in the sight of God. And so he tells him to do this. Repent therefore of this thy wickedness and pray God if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. For I perceive that thou art in the bond of, in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. And Simon immediately makes response. He immediately says, pray ye to the Lord for me that none of these things which ye have spoken come upon me. And the implication is that they did. Peter prayed for Simon. He repented. He changed his heart. He made self-assessment. You're right. What you have revealed is that my heart is not right with God. I appreciate you for telling me the truth. And I want to be right with God. Pray that none of these things 
fall upon me. He made self-assessment and he responded correctly. But in Acts chapter 24, we have an example of one who did not. Felix was in charge of Paul while he was in prison in Caesarea, while he was a, a captive in Caesarea. And Paul would come to Felix and it says in verse 25, he reasoned with Felix of righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come. What that means is that Paul was revealing to Felix how his life would have to change if he became a disciple of Christ. Temperance was something that he was not familiar with, that Felix did not practice. Righteousness, how to treat others right, temperance, and of judgment to come. And, and Felix understood the message. He made self-assessment. He saw from what the message revealed to him how his life was going to have to be different from this point forward. It caused him to tremble. Felix trembled, but he did not respond favorably. He answered and said, Go thy way for this time, for when I, I, when I call, when I have a convenient season, I will call for thee. You'll have that same choice. You will have that same moment of decision today. How will you respond? You have to make self-assessment based on the message that's been preached. It's not a message that's meant to harm you, hurt you, or humiliate you. It is a message that is only intended to help you come to Jesus for forgiveness through His blood. You will have that moment of decision. Will you respond by saying, pray for me that none of those things which you have spoken come upon me? Or will you say, go thy way? I'm not ready to make this decision yet. When I have a convenient season, I'll call for you. What this means when you make a self-assessment is you're going to have to ask yourself, how will my life change from this point forward? There may be things that you have to remove from your life that you have to repent of. There will also be some things that you have to add to your life from this point forward. Worship is going to have to become an, a regular part of who you are. Praying, singing, giving to God being evangelistic, sharing this message with others. These are things that will become part of who you are. I want you to see how your life is going to change from this point forward if you choose to respond to the invitation. But you've got to make that self-assessment. You're going to have to count the cost. This is what you must do. Remember what's on the table for you. Rest from your burdens, from your labors, forgiveness, eternal life in heaven in the presence of God Almighty. That's what's available to you. But think about also what you're going to have to give up. Pride, selfishness, greed, lust, sin. Those things are going to be removed. They're going to be taken away. They'll no longer be part of your identity. You have to make that choice. You have to make that decision to change. And it's going to come down to your response. Listen to the message with an open heart. Make self-assessment as you're hearing, as you're listening. Make application. But then you're going to have to take that first step. That first step is often the hardest. It is by far the hardest. If you're going to respond publicly, once you step out into that aisle, there'll be nothing but joy. There will be brothers and sisters cheering you on. Maybe not audibly but in their hearts they're rejoicing with you. But that first step is going to be the hardest. In Acts chapter 16, we have an example of a man who knew nothing of God, knew nothing of Jesus Christ. He was the jailer. He was the keeper of the prison where Paul and Silas had been kept. They were thrown into the innermost prison. And this jailer knew that his life was at stake because God caused an earthquake to open to release the bonds of every prisoner in the prison. He knew his life was at stake if even one of them escaped. But because of the influence of Paul and Silas, not a single prisoner fled, even when they had the opportunity to do so. This jailer is about to kill himself. He knows there's no hope for him. There's no reason for him to delay the inevitable. He is about to take his own life when verse 28 says, Paul cried with a loud voice saying, Do thyself no harm. I don't know why this is hitting me so hard right now. 
It's because I know that so many of you are in a position right now where you're doing yourself spiritual harm. And we are crying out with Jesus, stop. Do thyself no harm. This is the invitation. We are all here. He called for a light. The jailer called for a light. And he sprang in and came trembling. And he fell down before Paul and Silas. And he said, whatever it is that you're preaching, I want it. He brought them out and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? A man who knew nothing of God, who knew nothing of the love of Jesus Christ, once he sees how these Christians act, he says, I want this. And he was trembling at the thought of how his life is about to change, but he took that step. He sprang in. He responded. The first step is the hardest, but it is the best decision you can ever make. We're going to extend the Lord's invitation to you in just a moment, but I want you to see this first. Jonathan shared this on his, on his Facebook this week, and I thought that goes right with what we're saying here. Many times we get to a point where we say, I've been a Christian for all my life. There's nothing in my life that needs to change. I've heard every sermon there is to be preached a thousand times. There's nothing new to me. There's nothing for me to gain. Keep this in mind. The gospel still has something for you. You still have a potential to make a drastic change in your life. No matter who you are, no matter where you are in life, you must hear the message with an open heart. Be teachable. You are not always right. The Lord's invitation is yours. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Whether you respond publicly or privately is up to you. But we give you the opportunity now, if you need to be baptized, to put Christ on in baptism and have your sins washed away. If you've done that, we give you the opportunity to confess to God what you've done, to, to make a new change, to come back to Him and ask for prayers. But we give you the opportunity. Will you respond as we stand and sing?